know, I think to get started, it'd be best to ask uh, the uh, Commissioner Carpenter here about um, his history, his political yeah. history. I mean, he was on the council for like, you've been elected since what, like 78? It's funny that you say hey, you've been elected since 1978. Uh, one of my favorite questions is when people say, well, how'd you get started in politics? What, why? It started when I was elected president of my kindergarten class. Honestly, that's where it began. Our teacher decided that we were, we were going to hold an election and elect class officers in kindergarten. So it's, you know, 1975, 76. And, um, well, you were off by a few years. Well, <laughs> well. But he, I mean, I jumped into this bar because he was pretty close. Yeah. So the, um, uh, I found out was that my sole duty was to go to the lunchroom at lunchtime, pick up the milk order for the class, bring it back and pass it out to everyone. That was, that the, was the only duty. That was the that was the president's duty. job, and I, and I, and I, it's and the reason it's one of my favorite stories is I think that's a lesson in for a you know a six seven year old or actually whatever the correct age ages for kindergarten I was not held back, not in kindergarten. Um, uh, it was a lesson in servant leadership. Right. Oh, you're president, yep. then you serve everybody else in the room, mm -hmm. and and I think that was the lesson from from the teacher at the time, and and that's what got it started. And then I ran for, uh, you know, student government offices and uh, through junior high school and, and high school and such. And uh, never won. Lost every time. I uh, wasn't one of the cool kids. And then for some reason in 2004, after Missy and I, had, that's my wife, for anybody watching or listening, we'd moved into uh, shirts in 1998, in March of 1998. We actually still live in the same house. And for some reason, six years later, I decide I need to go to a city council meeting out of the blue. Hey, babe, I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm, long day at work. I just, I need to go to a city council meeting. I just need to see what's happening. And I look up on the dais. There was no one there with young kids. I thought to myself, who is representing, representing you. me? Yeah. Right. Who's representing my demographic right now? And mm -hmm. so I decided right then and there that it was time for me to run. So I went, well, I went back to the house and I told my, I told Missy, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run for, I'm, I'm running for city council. And she said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> you're right in the middle of your master's degree. You don't have time to take on something else. Mm -hmm. And in a... Um, uh, and that was here in San Antonio. You were working on your degree, right? Yeah. So no, no politics, no voted, no nothing between kindergarten and, and 2004. 2004. That's correct. And then you just cut and went to the meeting and you got fired up. I got fired up. And... Wow. You know, she you in, a, in, a, in a poor marital choice moment, yeah. I, I, I ran anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what were they talking? Was it like a hot button issue or you just said, I'm not represented? I mean, they weren't trying to build a wall and have Cibolo pay for it. So I ran or? anyway in 2004 against my wife's good advice, and I lost by 27 votes. Um, oh, my goodness. To somebody that was already incumbent? or Yeah, yeah. Uh, to a great man, Steve Simonson. Okay. A fantastic okay. human being, and and as I look back, I'm I'm excited <clears throat> I didn't win because he was shortly thereafter or in that vicinity diagnosed with ALS, and oh. you know had I knocked him out, he wouldn't have had the the pleasure of serving through to when he was not yeah. able to function anymore. So yeah. mm. that one worked out well. And then I, give us elevator pitch, sir. What do you do currently? And um, who do you do it to? Two. Gosh, I'm not, I'm not sure that. I, <laughs> I, I think it's a four. Is, I, I love the way that's if, worded. If the question is, to whom do I do yes. what I do, <laughs> I am sure that there are times when uh, uh, I really annoy some of my colleagues on the on commissioner's court. <laughs> now, I currently serve as the uh, Precinct 3 Commissioner in Guadalupe County. Yeah, and I was looking at the map of that earlier. I think Jason, can you pull the map up over there? Yeah, you know, right, we're gonna pull you, it up here. I was looking at. I was wondering if more people voted for you in kindergarten. It doesn't look real big. So yeah, we're, so that's the precinct there in the uh, the pink. Yeah, did you have to do a lot of campaigning? Uh, I did a lot of campaigning. <laughs> yeah. I did it whether whether I had to or not. I, I did, and and it's uh, you know Ted Cruz said once a, a good while ago. There's two ways to run a campaign: unopposed or scared. Uh, and so you put the work Fair. in no matter what. Did you uh, ever petition the county to make their map on their website their uh, red for that area? Just <laughs> friendly suggestion. The yeah. purple kind of makes me a little nervous, you know. Yeah. So this is a new district, right? <laughs> it has been recently uh, redrawn. That is correct. So prior to um, your seat, it was only three districts. Is that right? It's always been four. It's always been four. Yeah, so for um, for the 254 uh, counties in Texas, all of them have four precincts and a county judge. 
Okay. Whether they're Loving County, which has maybe 450, 500 people in it now, to Harris County, which is the largest county in the state. All set up the same way. Okay. Uh, under state law. So uh, is this going to be, um, I don't know, a little more distributed at some point, do you think? I mean, how, I don't, how does that work? I mean, it, yeah. I thought it was a new district, so I had no idea. That's interesting. So has it always been this, um, uh, I guess, small divided? I, I didn't want to. <laughs> has it always been this, um, you know, ba- the boundaries of it? Yeah. Has it always been that small? Yeah, it's okay. I'm five, seven and a half with boots on. I know I'm short. <laughs> so the small jokes, I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. <laughs> no, but really, is it, is it, is the, it's the driven, always it's, this way? It's driven by population. Yeah. Okay. And so the population yeah. centers are, are where you, I mean, where you see them there, right? Seguin in the center mm-hmm. um, and to the, to the far west end of the county, it, it's Cibolo and, and shirts that mm-hmm. make up the majority of uh, the population up up in the whether you have the divide between the green and the i don't know lightened salmon color yeah. um peach you've got new Braunfels, mm-hmm. the portion that's in uh in guadalupe county so those population centers are really what drive the uh boundaries the, the boundaries of the precincts the green one precinct one is roughly 50 percent of the land mass in the county but each one of the precincts has approximately 45,000 people. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. Actually. Well, yeah, well, well, that that's what matters, right? Is the number of people. So the, you know, yeah, uh, it, that's a smaller geographical, but it's got more population into a smaller area. What area of those districts pays the most in property tax? Roughly. It's, it's roughly proportional, mm-hmm. but it's not, Exactly. Okay. And there's a, there's several things that go on that cause that. One, in the rural portions, there's a lot of ag exemption that's out there. Okay. In the urbanized portions, we have, as we know, a lot of retired military. And a lot of those retired military are partially or fully disabled, and that, that drives what they pay in property tax, mm. right? So it, it, it's so variable. Um, the aggregation answer is it's roughly roughly the same but the distribution uh, and use of those tax dollars is not necessarily roughly proportional in that precinct as it's drawn right now my precinct three there are zero miles of county roads in that precinct really yeah so there's out of, out of roughly i believe it's 611 or maybe be just slightly more now so um, but the taxes go into the to the county road pot I mean, there's a there's a pot for the county road that this is all you know. You put all the money in the pot and divide it up into whether you need to allocate your resources. So these guys over here in your district are uh, they're getting shafted out of county road taxes. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say shafted necessarily is aggressive. Word. It's a it's a it's a tough. It, that's shafted. a touchy subject right now. I mean, let's be what I, what I would say is this that um, uh, we did do a project with the city of Shirts uh, since I came into office where we. The city of Shirts put up the money for materials, and the county built about a two-mile stretch of road that'll be mm-hmm. completed this summer. So it did come back to the precinct mm-hmm. um, in the form of cooperation between the county and the city of Shirts for a section of road that was once a, once uh, maintained by the county, mm-hmm. but now within Shirts city limits. So therefore, mm-hmm. it goes to the city. City, yeah. And uh, that's the way principally that lateral road and bridge tax dollars come back into that precinct. And that is with cooperative work between the county and the cities. <clears throat> the purpose of the county commissioner, there's four districts, there's four county commissioners, and then there's a county judge. Correct. So the county commissioners, their responsibility, their duties are um, w- roughly what? We are the uh, the legislative body with the per- that handles the purse strings. So the, the thing that is probably most important to taxpayers is, the the commissioner's court mm-hmm. decides how all of the tax dollars are spent. When we set the the sheriff's office budget, we set the road and bridge budget. We we are the purse strings holders, if you will, mm-hmm. um, in in county government. That's the primary thing that we do. Okay, um, there are many other functions, um, not the least of which. You know, back to the point that that Kevin, I think you were driving toward is is maintaining relationships within our borders of our precincts with the cities and, and any other political subdivision that is there, including school districts. 
mm-hmm. right? So it it um, because there's there's one pool of tax money really, mm-hmm. right? We if 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 you live in Guadalupe County, you pay this much in taxes, mm-hmm. and it goes to various entities. And I think it is a responsibility of every elected official in a given county to first recognize that and then find ways to not duplicate spend. Sure. Right. How do we find ways to, to, to consistently work together or at least do things that are complementary mm-hmm. um, so that we're not double spending? Well, there's also some other things in your budget. You know, obviously you have to fund all the offices. So sheriff's department. Mm-hmm. Tax assessor, collector, the uh, appraisal auditors, district. The, uh, no, that's a separate issue. Okay, that's a separate that's district. A separate, separate political animal. Let's just okay, say that. Yeah, way. that's fine. Um, so, so you decide, hey, we need to spend some money on something in the county related for this area, and is that where the judge comes in and says you can't do that? Uh, it's voted on by commissioners court. So each each of the precinct commissioners and the judge have a vote. Okay. So the judge uh, is. I would construe what the judge does in the county as far as commissioner's court goes. He is the first of equals or first among equals Mm -hmm. uh, and the chairman of the meetings. Uh, But the judge can't act unilaterally except in very few occasions, much like the mayor of a city. If there's a disaster declaration, the Mm -hmm. state gives him certain, him or her, certain uh, powers that he, he or she can exercise outside of a consensus or vote from commissioner's court. How long were you mayor for sure? For seven years. Three terms. Seven years, three terms. And you, there's no there's no term limits for mayor and shirts, right? There are no term and limits. And so what I thought was really um, commendable was you said, I remember hearing you say that, um, and I'm probably butchering this, feel free to correct me. <laughs> feel free to correct me what I thought I heard you say <laughs> way back when. But when, when you decided that you were going to step down from, uh, not you're, you weren't going to run again, you know, it, you had said something about, you know, you've done a lot of good work in, in shirts and then it was just time to move on. Mm-hmm. So I think what I, th- I personally feel what's commendable about that is like, you, you're not looking to, you know, sit in a spot forever. You've done some good things. You've acknowledged the good things that you've done. You're going to move on with your life. You're going to build you know, you're going to learn more stuff for yourself to, you know, moving forward or whatever. And you left your office in a good position. So the next guy that comes in, he can do great things and he's not picking up a mess. I thought that was really, I thought that was pretty solid, pretty stand up. I, I, I don't, well, you don't hear that very often. Well, yeah, it wasn't just a, a good position that, you know, when, when Mike was made, well, you were on the council first for a couple terms, right? Seven and a half years. Seven and a half years. So that's three years. or four. Yeah. And so, and then he, he uh, became mayor uh, first election. He ran against Hal Baldwin. In 2010. And who was the mayor. And um, I lost. That was, I'm, I'm eight and two. And then, uh, and then, us. and then, then you, then, then Hal stepped down, right? Or uh, did he no, pass? No, actually, Hal passed uh, in office, so he was elected again in 2012. Mm-hmm. I did not oppose him in 2012. He he was unopposed, yeah. um, and he passed prior to the election. Mm-hmm. And in the state of Texas, if you're on the ballot, you can't be removed. So he was actually elected uh, in 2012 posthumously. Wow, that's, that's nice. It, it really, it really was. As I look back yeah. on it, that was a. Um, it was a, a fantastic uh, capstone, if you will, to an extraordinary life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then you ran against, uh, I think Cedric was in one of those elections, Cedric Edwards. So a special election had to be called in uh, 2012 for November, and there were three of us in that one. That was Steve White, Cedric Edwards, and and me. So it was a three, three-man three race, if you will. And uh, I, was, I, I was just blessed enough to come out with right at 50% of the vote. And so, uh, I and was, what year was this? That's November of 2012. 2012. Okay, great. Yeah. So you, you were that, let's see, mayor Daly had already been elected mayor at this point. He reminds right? me of that all the time. Oh, does he? <laughs> <laughs> he did not put well, me up to that. I was just thinking, trying to do the quick math on that though. Right. But I heard you helped him with his paperwork or something. <laughs> he decided, mayor Daly. And if you were here in the room, he would, uh, he would not argue with me about this. Uh, he said, he was going to run for mayor. And I said, that's great. What can I do to help you? He said, I went and picked up a packet today. I'm going to start. I don't, I don't want. <laughs> let it fly. Let it fly. Yeah, yeah. I said, I went and picked up a packet today. And it's like 100 pages. What is this? Yeah, I, it's said, like a I said, mayor. Yeah, I wasn't mayor yet. I said, Tom, you know, you need about five of them. 
come by the house. Let's talk. Well, that's easy. How, how would I have ever figured that out? I said you wouldn't have. It's just it's it's complicated potentially for a reason. Um, and yeah, I did help him out with it. I just got yeah. him just got him through the simple filing of the paperwork. And yeah. the rest is as you know, it's, it's Selma history. <laughs> uh, yeah, and there's a lot of history there. You know, I can't we can't wait to get yeah, to get some of it there, so. has been recorded. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. So yeah, and, and I, I remember when you first ran. I didn't know you then, um, but I knew Cedric because of some of my things with the Tri County, sure. and of course, uh, or the Randolph Chamber, the sh- the Chamber, the Church Chamber at the time. I guess it was. Were you contested every time? Yes. Yeah, every time every time you had an opponent, and sometimes the same opponent. A couple of times I remember that, but it was never ever close after that, was it? I mean, you kept widening the margin, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I was very blessed to have the. Uh, uh, the trust and support of the people of shirts. Yeah. What do you think? Like, you know, as mayor, I've never asked you this, you know, besides the soccer fields that I use all the time, here's <laughs> my trophy for my soccer team. We just won a championship because you built those fields and I know I'm going to continue. I don't them. think there's a direct correlation between having the fields built and you winning. <laughs> well, we, 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 we practice there. So we train there. I spend four nights a week. Um, the last couple of years of my life out there. And before that, before you built them, I was out there a lot. Besides the soccer complex, which I'm a big fan of, what what would you say is like a couple of your biggest accomplishments? In the aggregate, over the seven years, the city was was left in a in a stronger position. In fact, I would dare to say in a much stronger position. Not coming from a weak one, sure. but simply in a much stronger position than where we had been, you know, seven years before. Now, this is an, this is very important that I make this point. That's not because I was somebody special on my own that made some mm-hmm. amazing contribution. You know, all of us tend to stand on the shoulders of giants and the leadership in the city of shirts from 1958 when the city was incorporated all the way through when I got to the mayor's chair was incredibly strong leadership. People that put their hearts and souls into making their community a better place. And so I was, I was the beneficiary of, of all of that work that came before me. I'm going to call something out that I, I think that I drive this road once in a while. And I think, man, if people understood the hardship and the stuff and the work that went through to bit to get this road done, and that's the road between Evo and Santico's Cibolo Valley drive. When you uh, worked out that with mayor Boyle and the city of Cibolo yeah. and those two communities finally came back together after, you know, some strife with the, the toll road and some of those type of things. And you you got, I don't know how all that went down, but that's something I think that the two cities, that's like a joining point. Like you should have a parade on that road every year. That's like everybody coming back together for everybody's economic benefit. And every time I turn around and I get invited to events, it's the city of Cibolo finally having some economic development along I-35 you were a part of that, and that's going to expand out into the shirt side with Evo. And are both of those now in your district? Um, they are. And, and you know, and part of that whole thing, and I watched the, the council meetings in Cibolo when you guys were going through that, and, you know, Mayor Boyle was so proud, you know, that it's going to be called Cibolo Valley Drive, and that sign was going to hang off of uh, I-35 and, you know, be another little marketing, put, you know, the roadway into you know to, to downtown Cibolo and there's wonderful things going on there and this is kind of like that gateway and it's a boulevard and you drive behind Santico's to HEB and it's like man all of that is possible because you two sat down and decided to work out some details and see if you can come up with an agreement and everybody wins he and I were were playing in a charity golf tournament and mm-hmm. we were sharing a golf cart and we were both playing bad golf <laughs> um, but we were having convers <laughs> we were having conversations away from everyone and everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, more so because we were off the fairway and, and not able to be anywhere near <laughs> yeah. any other golfers. Not by choice. It yeah. was just, you know, the help. But we, we, the conversations that we had were, were very frank and, and very open and, and respectful. And uh, um, he asked, you know, what if the city of Cibolo did this? Would you consider making the name change? And I said, well, what if we just did it for the good of the, the, the community? What if we just did it? And, of course, I had a reason in addition to just the good of the community. And that is that Wiederstein road appears three times in the city of shirts, which is a dispatch nightmare. Mm. So Mm. it was actually in the interest, at least in a very small way, because there's no, there were no physical addresses on that street, but not to have three Wiederstein roads in the same city. Sure. So I said, why don't we dispatch already calls it Cibolo Valley drive because it's an extension. So we'll, we'll just, just do it. Let's just do it. Um, and we got it done. 
And, and we came together in a partnership for the expansion of the road, the improvement of the road. Um, and it, it took a long time to get there, but it, we got it done. And, and it, it's, it's, it's also a commentary on, on what can happen as opposed to what's happening right now in a political world that we live in. Mm-hmm. People don't talk to one another, right? People yep. on the left and right tend, tend, to, yep. tend to not talk to one another. Now, here at the local level, we have to be a lot more pragmatic. But in Austin, in, in Washington, the two sides don't talk together very often. If we spent more time listening and hearing each other, things can be accomplished. I mean, I think that it's fair to say that on, uh, you know, on the right and left, there's probably 10% on, on either end that's, that are non-negotiables, right? Sure. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I, some of my Democratic friends and I are not going to agree on 10 to 20% of, of, of the things that would come up between us. Mm-hmm. But that leaves 80% in the middle right. that we yeah. can work on together, that we can talk mm-hmm. about together, that we can collaborate for the common good. And that doesn't happen as often as it should. And I would say that Cibolo Valley Drive, its renaming, its expansion, the partnership between, uh, amongst rather, the developer and the two cities came about because of a couple of guys stopping and talking. Right, and it's helping take the tax burden off of everybody that lives in both those communities because you're adding those businesses, and the sales tax, obviously, is the fairest way to pay bills. You know that in the government. The second thing, you know, my opinion, the second thing is is, is it also creates, it's creating a bunch of jobs and opportunities for moms and dads that might be staying at home and with kids. They don't, they want to work part-time. There's going to be some, you know, a lot of opportunities. They're putting a school in back there. That whole area is beautiful. It's Antico's area and, and even Evo right there. I mean, that, all of that is killer development. Let me segue into this. And so for that development area, let's talk about that area real quick. You have, you have the, the two cities, right? And some business comes to the county and calls you or you run into them at a lunch and hey we're top golf we want to put in a top golf does is that something as a county commissioner you would help work what because you don't have an edc person in guadalupe county correct assigned so is that something where you get the mayors together and then the county can offer tax abatements or 380s and the, the cities can as well not a lot of people know that right the cities take the lead on that but as the commissioner for the precinct i would probably be the person that would spend the most time with the economic development uh, directors from the two cities and the elected officials to try to work something out that would be mutually beneficial for the entire community. Perfect. And, well, and as long as we're talking taxes, and I noticed this is like a hot button topic right now. Um, I've been watching the news lately, and it looks like Bear County is going to do some sort of an additional homestead exemption tax uh, credit. Have you heard about that? They're looking for a way to offset what the appraisal district's done. And I don't know if it's long-term sustainable or is that, is that something you think could potentially come up with Guadalupe County? So it, it, it took us 45 minutes to get to a, a good challenging question. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. it, so Kevin, it is, it is so, it is so much of a complex system. So you and I both know having uh, been involved with the Texas municipal league, being in, in local mm-hmm. uh, government politics, that one of the biggest drivers of what we pay in local property tax are decisions that are made in Austin by the state legislature. Mm-hmm. You know, somewhere in the neighborhood of forty to fifty-five percent. It varies by school district and varies by counties. Um, of our property tax burden is schools. If the legislature funds the school districts to a higher level. Then, then what the school districts have to get from local property taxes falls. That's a delicate balance. And when the legislature passes their um, uh, their budget every biennial, somewhere, and typically it's like on page 82, um, they talk about what that, that budget anticipates statewide the appraisal districts will have to raise appraisal rates in order to accommodate and support that budget from the state. Mm-hmm. So you can, we can throw exemptions at it. We can throw um, a, a bigger homestead exemption, more, more exemptions for the military. The fact is that the, the money that's required to run the state, to run the school districts, the taxing authorities that have to produce at the local level and uh, uh, in response to the demands of the people that live there, until we have a very different structure as far as how revenues are raised and how we fund our school districts in the state, 
Uh, we don't have a, a, a simple solution. There's not a silver bullet solution. There's not one lever that we can press that's going to provide relief. It's going to take a comprehensive review of a very compl- complex system, and it's going to have to come out of Austin. And I, and I but I really appreciate that answer, answer because that's another thing of I've noticed more in um, in city uh, larger city politics, state politics. You certainly see it, but it's these little political theater antidotes, you know. And that's I'm I'm not putting anybody down. My friends in Bayer County certainly, you know, you know, friends that are county commissioners over there. But you know, you kind of look at it like you know makes the news makes it look like you're trying to give some people some relief and you know at the end of the day but for guadalupe county taxes your tax rates are already so low you know it's not going to affect your county taxes as much as it would you know if the school district did something and the school districts aren't in a position to afford that especially right now with the the school safety and some of those type of things that i mean they have they have some really big issues they're they're dealing with right now so anybody that's complaining about their property taxes needs to complain to austin not anybody local basically <laughs> the go, short go. answer to that is hell yes okay yeah well, That's exactly right now i would i'd go are, to the county and the school district but stay away from the city council members and yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> the, the um there are there are um political subdivisions in the state of texas that are not conservatively run that that spend more money on things than they should okay no question and and that kind of of uh, you know, now, what is waste and what is not is is subjective. subjective. It's 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 the eye of the beholder, uh, but I think for the majority of the counties and uh, in, the, in the state and the cities that are in those counties, the vast majority uh, are conservatively run, and there's not a lot of waste. It's it's a matter of it's a constant balancing balancing act to maintain services and safety mm-hmm. and 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 development and controlling development, all those things, just to 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 to, to get in that that equilibrium point where the taxes are acceptable and the services meet the need. It's a, it's a difficult thing, but I think that's well done in most of the cities and most of the counties in the state. The, the, the Guadalupe <laughs> County just added or is adding or just added a PIO position. There's no layers of management over there. You go to the, the, I mean, the tax assessor's office is one floor. You, know, you walk in and, you know, wave to them, you know, standing in the lobby you know, I mean, Guadalupe County especially is, you know, efficient, you know, very efficiently run. And I drive, you know, I drive to Colorado in the summer and I go through all these little county, you know, because they're all small. And you go up through the panhandle and I'm like, that's the whole courthouse. And all of the uh, commissioners have an office in the courthouse because the four precincts come together in the center of the county. And they actually, the JPs are in, in different corners of the courthouse because they can't afford any buildings outside of that out in the precincts. So, yeah, that's exactly what you're seeing. You know, you also have taxing, uh, municipal taxing authorities in some of these things, and not going to run anybody over in Bear County, but there are some of them. Then, you know, they have, you know, big fancy offices and nice, beautiful drapes on the windows. Oh, and, I know you know, the reference easy now. Yeah, yeah, easy yeah, now. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, oh, I, have, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends that are, um, that are elected down there. And I, you know, and I appreciate the work. And, you know, they come into these jobs and they just want their stuff done. They're busy dealing with stuff. And, you, know, you get elected and you come to this office and, you know, you got to take down, you know, the old chi posters and stuff, but, uh, you know, move into your office down there. But I, you know, they have, they have budgets and they you know, people get complacent. They're used to just doing this and like, oh, well get these blinds, whatever you got last time, just make them yellow this time. Do you want to do lightning round? Yeah, sir. Pick a color. Red. Red it is. And that's not a political Instantly. statement necessarily. So, okay, here's the deal. There's um, These are completely off-the-wall questions. They have nothing to do with politics or entrepreneurship or really anything that matters. Um, I'm going to draw five cards for five because that's my contribution. And, Pat, Kevin, you want to you read these off to him? Yeah, sure, why not? Just remember, as you're hearing these, you pick the deck. So, Okay, great. All right, this so is this is... Uh, would you rather? Would you rather... See Oprah Winfrey or Arnold Schwarzenegger as the next U.S. president. The Perfect. Go- the gover- Perfect. The, the governator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would. I would. I hope they're all that simple. Uh, yes, yes. That one's a no-brainer. All right. <laughs> would you rather lick every inanimate object you see, you. or be licked by every living thing you see? Um, every inanimate object, because I'm 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 a curious human being. Yeah, I agree. With uh, that. That'd be the lesser of those two evils. Would you rather never celebrate your birthday again, 
or never drink alcohol again. Well, I would I would rather never celebrate my birthday again because yeah. I'm getting old, Kevin. Yes. I'm yes. okay with just yeah. saying, yeah, I stopped at 54. Yeah, would you rather your fingers always feel sticky or your throat always feels itchy? My well, fingers sticky. Sticky fingers are yeah, for sure. Of course. I can, of course I can, a politician's going to have sticky, sticky fingers. fingers. <laughs> It's like a made for a politics yeah, guy yeah, question. Yeah, it is, I mean, yeah. uh... All right. Would you rather, this one is appropriate. Would you rather have long nose hair or long ear hair? Henry Kissinger. Nose? Hair? Nose. <laughs> yeah. nose hair? He's got both, yeah. though, right? Yeah, he's got a, Trying he's, to think which one's longer on him. Coming around and so that it. was actually one of the free lessons. If you don't want to answer the question <laughs> that's been put to you as a politician, answer something random, and everybody goes, <laughs> what? What what, what 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 was that? By the time they recover, the moment's over. <laughs> Kissinger. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm Got Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how long have you been in this seat, in the, the District 3? Uh, just right at 16 months. 16 months. 17 months. So expectation versus reality. Did you, you know, is it is it the reality about what you expected? Is it way different? You know, how does, how does that look? The one salient difference between being involved in a city and a county is that a home rule city in the state of Texas can largely do anything that it wants to, except what the state has said they may not do. Mm -hmm. A county may do nothing, but what the state has told them they may do. Interesting. So the, the, what counties are allowed to do is codified and in, um, and, and is inflexible, uh, in state law. So that's that's a big difference. Yeah. So, so you can't pass an ordinance banning fireworks. That's why the fireworks stands are always out in the county. We can't pass an ordinance of any sort. We can only have orders of the court that are pursuant to the rights given us by the state. Jeez. What you just said right now. Did you know that when you were uh, in, in uh, city politics? Because you said that like uh, I couldn't even read it out of a book that well. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, so, you just had it right there on boom. <laughs> um, if you sit in the mayor's chair for seven years, time and grade will give you some uh, some expertise in in placing words together uh, by sheer necessity because of terror. I was going to ask you. I wanted. Uh, there's always a question I've never asked you. And I've been wondering about. All of a sudden, there's a school shooting. Something happens in your city, and all of a sudden, you're the mayor. And that, like Tom. Daily, our mayor in Selma wears that stuff. He goes to bed with it. That stuff goes on vacation with him because he loves this city, and I'm sure you love shirts. But going from that to a county commissioner, did you feel a little bit of that? Like, what was it like not being mayor after being mayor for so long? You, you just touched on something that's very important, and uh, it's this. It's a different world. It's a different world from being on city council. It's a different world from being a county commissioner. It's a different world from serving as a state representative or a state senator. If you're in the middle chair, it's a completely different playing field. The seven years that I was blessed by the people of Shirts to be allowed to serve mm -hmm. was the greatest education of my life. I had no idea on day one. And I want to tell you a quick story about when it, it dawned on me what being in that chair really meant. You remember when the fires and explosions were happening up in the city of West Texas? Yep. Right? And no one really knew for sure what was causing it in the beginning and or how bad it would get or how many more explosions there would be. And uh, the city of Shirts maintains an ambulance bus that is required to respond when called upon. And so we sent that ambulance bus going up towards West Texas with our, our people on board. And they were going to drive into the hot zone, and they were they were supposed to go and use that multi bed ambulance for its designed purpose. And it was about two o'clock in the morning, Kevin, and I woke up, and I um, I realized at that moment, and it was never the same from that moment forward, that if something happened to one of those people that we sent into harm's way. I was powerless to do anything about it if something tragic occurred. That the only thing I could do was offer their family a flag folded neatly. Jeez. And I, um, I knew, I understood it a little bit before mm. that, but from that <clears throat> moment forward, I understood so much more clearly 
my responsibility. I realized in that moment, too, that I was the most expendable person in the entire organization. When you hang around with mayors and you have friends, and I, you know, Mike and I are certainly close friends. Um, Tom Daly and I are close friends. Stosh and I are close friends. When you hang around with people like that, they don't have to tell you. You know it because you're around them. You can feel it. Like you could feel what Mike was just telling us in this room, and that's what mayors deal with. And then, then you go to your council meeting, and they they tell the story. Of, you know, somebody's upset about a pothole or whatever. But that that bombing thing was terrifying. It was, and that was in your city. It was. It, it was. So what happened? I find out what's happening, and I, I won't bring up how mm-hmm. I find out, but I find out what's happening as I'm. Crossing 35, my phone starts to ring. And the first phone number is actually Washington in the District of Columbia. Oof. And um, I didn't answer it. It was NP- NPR out of, uh, out of D.C. Oh, my gosh. And then, uh, wow. and then the phone calls, the, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, um, CNN, Fox, uh, all lighten my phone up because you know I've, I've published my phone number since the first time I, I ran for office. It's not a secret; it can be found by anybody that wants to find it. Mm-hmm. So I didn't answer any of those because I I I didn't have anything intelligent that I could say yet, and I didn't know what the situation was. And I knew that one of the most important things that you can do in a leadership position is not to try speculate. to act, <laughs> try to act important and speculate. Right. Well, here's what I think's going on. No, so I, I got there and I was moved into. Um, um, one of the FBI trailers and um, I got to sit down in a room with my EMS director, my chief of police and the ATF and FBI folks. And um, I got to hear the things that they were talking about. You know, the, this, this package had detonated within the facility. It was at this height and the closest worker was at this height. And, you know, they're only so many seconds away from that thing being at a height where it would have taken out a human being and all of these things that we're learning. And um, I sat there for about two hours, and I got to see some of the most amazing work I've ever witnessed. So, and, and what I like to say about it is this. Anybody listening or watching right now, the, the capabilities of the FBI and the ATF and the Texas Rangers, the feet on the street, the frontline folks, is far better than what it's portrayed as on television. They are Mm. far more capable than we can even imagine until you see it. Um, I need to be the first to speak. And the ATF guy that's there says, well, Mr. Mayor, what, uh, what does he think you want to say? (laughs) (laughs) So what, what, what do you think your role is in, in this? I mean, yes, we have a, 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 press conference planned here but what he said what are you thinking about saying and I, I i told him he said no 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 type it up on your phone hand it to me so we walked out and uh and i read it exactly as i had been given permission to read it it's it's sort of early this morning a package mm-hmm. exploded in a distribution facility here in shirts uh, an employee who reported an injury was evaluated on site and then released at this time, however, the scene and area are secured and the investigation is continuing. The safety of the employees and the public has been, is, and remains our principal focus. A pertinent to the focus on public safety, the city of Schertz is engaged and is working in cooperation with the FBI and the ATF. Here with me this morning are my chief of police, Michael Hansen. Assistant Special Agent in Charge James Smith from the FBI and Assistant Special Agent in Charge Frank Ortega from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. At this time, I'd like to recognize our Chief of Police, Michael Hansen, who will provide you with some additional information. Fox News, after the fact, said, what are, what's the matter with these people? Why would you hold a press conference if you don't have anything that you can say? What's the point of having a press conference if there's no, no information to be delivered? And the backstory is, is that 15 minutes or so before we were supposed to go on the air with the mm-hmm. press conference, a call came from Austin and said, everything we talked about that you guys were supposed to be able to say, you can't say it. Whoa. Don't say a thing. So right. yeah. transitioning into, um, you know, commissioner, mm-hmm. is there a little bit of breathe easy? 
the the short answer to that is yes, there is. I mean, there it's is. still it's your different. community. I, I mean, I know you still care. Don't get me wrong. Of but. course. And the, the county commissioner's role is much more of a hands-on role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, sitting in the mayor's chair is a lot about um, – you know, trying to set policy and 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 create a, a an organizational feel and all of those kinds of things. Much of what happens in in a county commissioner's role is hands on, trying really working directly with people to solve problems or get things done. Yeah, the and people it, that call you usually are like they know the office, they know what's going. It's not usually Joe Random with some you know shred day got canceled argument or you know something. <laughs> No, it's it's it. It can be why why did you put on a burn man? And I'm not picking on any of the why other. Why did you say I'm letting it go? <laughs> you know why why do you, why are you not letting us put you know detonate fireworks on on July Fourth this year? You know, this big because the it, the chance for fire is so bad because of the, it, it's very practical mm-hmm. in in almost all of its uh, um, responsibilities. Do you feel like there's more red tape or less? It's different red tape, Orange and they're tape. different shades. Yeah, but it, it's. Organizations that have a mixture of employees and elected officials, I think all share some challenges, some common challenges, and and bureaucracy and red tape are just a natural, a normal and customary part of that environment. I, I want to come back to something that Jason right. asked earlier, uh, and it was it was some commentary along, you know, seven years and you didn't see yes. a fourth term, mm-hmm. and, and, and yes. why is that? And one of the biggest reasons is this, that President Washington gave us an important lesson there was tons of talk about you could serve for life. We, you, you can, you can, you can be president for life. You can do this as long. We might even his exaltedness, the president or all. And he, he, he simply said, I've, I've, I've done my time serving. I've done the best that I can do. And it's time for me to go back to my private life. And it's time for the next person to serve. Mm-hmm. And I, and, and some of my decision was, was, was based on that. You know, he served about eight years. Most of our presidents, until it was codified, only served a term or two. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't understand why that was a healthy thing until I was in my seventh year. And I, I was in a place where I was frustrated with some decisions that had been made by the city council. And I was looking at myself in the mirror and thinking, how can they make... I know what's best. I know what the answer is. These folks don't know what they're... And I caught myself looking in the mirror. And when you're in an elected position and you start to believe that you have all the answers because you're the one that's been there the longest, it's time, time, to, on. it's time to go. When Mike was mayor, one of the things he always did that I always really thought was genius, and it's like, man, I, if I was going to be a mayor, I'd like to be a mayor of your style of city. He'd be like, well, what's the pleasure of the council? Is there going to be a motion? And everybody would sit there and look at him. And he's like, <laughs> Well, what do we need to do? Well, is there you can take action, and sometimes the council wouldn't even know what to do, and it would just kind of arbitrarily get tabled or whatever, and it would just you know every once in a while. But he would sit there and he'd have, he wouldn't say anything his opinion on it. Yeah, it didn't matter. What do you guys want to do? And then I'll I'll jump in on this. And he and or he, not? Yeah, yeah, and you played it that way a lot, especially towards the end of your tenure. I noticed you got really good at that, and I was like, wow, that's really a smart way to. Because you, your opinion isn't necess- unless it's something you're very passionate about, it's not going to carry a lot of weight. Here's what I would put in my head when we had a council chambers that were full of, of discord, anger, whatever was going on. And, and this is something I realized at another point at 2 o'clock in the morning on another night earlier in my time as mayor. Mm-hmm. I would look around the room and would take in what was going on and what I would tell myself at that moment so that I wouldn't get upset or emotionally in, involved and in, in, engrossed in what was happening, here, here, here's what I would myself talk. Look at this. This is just how the founders imagined and hoped. Here we are. We're having this free debate, this free commentary, anger, happiness, disappointment. All these things are happening in a public forum, unfettered. Look at this, just like the founders hoped it would be. And with that in my head, I was able to stay level. Do you believe in term limits? Based on what I said earlier, I don't think that there's a need for statutory term limits. I think term limits should be something that is a self-discipline. You have specific language when you talk about politics, and that is serving. And so personally... 
I, I'm, I'm not very much in the in the politics, but personally, I feel like all elected positions should be that similar to jury duty. You should be obligated to serve your community. I feel in some sort of capacity, and then, like you had said, you know, it's there comes a time when it's time to move on. Term limits. You feel like that's not something that should be, you know, hey, um, you know, three years, two, years, whatever. It's just something that should be self discipline. If but, someone, if someone can be effective for longer than what a term limit might be set in, does does that body or that community gain by cutting them out? And the answer to that, in my mind, is no. In fact, it's a net loss. If they're not effective, then it's really incumbent upon the voting community to remove them from office. So when you ran, you ran in the, your last election, Mike, you ran for county commissioner. How many votes did, did you, did you have saying. an opponent? Um, not in the uh, general election. No, in the primary though, you had an opponent, right? I did. Yes. And how many, how many votes did it take for you to be seated? I don't remember exactly. I just remember percentages, but it was, it was I think there were maybe 5,000 or so votes that were, were cast. Right. And, and that's, that's, that goes back to, you know, that's the thing that continues to, to where Jason's like, Oh my gosh. Well, and yeah. So we had Jose nobody Macias. votes, you know? Yeah. We had Jose Macias on here and he, you know, the, he was a school, he's a school trust, board trustee. Judson trustee. Yep. And out of 50,000 people, 1200 voted, you know? So, I mean, <laughs> and, and I mean, if you understood what this, so say, that's kind of like, I think might've been where we were going with this part is, is the same thing. Yeah. I mean, you have somebody who, you know, Mayor sounds a whole lot more um, official than commissioner, but it also seems like you have a lot more, um, I don't know if influence is the right word, but there's a lot more uh, purse in the purse strings than mayor. You know what I mean? Like you, you have, you have a lot more, um, I don't say you and, but I'm saying like, there's a lot more responsibility financially, fiscally with the commissioner seat than the mayor. And I'm one of five votes instead of zero of seven. Okay. So yeah. yes, indeed. So I feel like there is a big disconnect from the community and our local officials when it comes to voting. There's a group, a niche of people, a niche of people like you yep. that you're very involved with, you know, not just the city that you're in, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you could talk politics all day. And then a lot of people are, are you know, self-removed or whatever, and they go to vote. If they do, then they're looking for names that they know. Yep. You know, I, I, I would love to get some data on that. You know what will blow your mind? So what is it? District 25, that's uh, Henry Cuellar's seat, right? And he's going to be, he, he won, uh, beat, um, just yesterday, beat Jessica Cisneros. It's official or they announced her. Mm -hmm. She's going to talk in recount and he said there's no point. I think we're kind of at a point now where if she's asking for a recount, that's somewhat, you're kind of conceding at that point, right? You're like, so... On the Republican side, there was five people or something running, and I think the first place winner, um, before they got to a runoff, got like 6,000 votes. Cassie Garcia got like 6,000 votes. The district is from New Braunfels down to Laredo all the way down to the Valley. You, I mean, 6,000 votes. And I started looking at her budget and I was like, you could have bought everybody out for steak dinner like every day. Like, you know, like, you know, wow, you know, all those TV ads and stuff for 6,000 votes. I mean, it was just unbelievable to me. Yeah. Voter turnout is terrible. Are they busy I, on Facebook arguing? Is that what's going on? I mean, I, I don't get angry about that, however, simply yeah. because. If folks are not showing up at the at the ballot, then to some degree they're Good satisfied thing. with the world around them, or feel they're completely defeated, or, or that that's there are some mm -hmm. of those as well. There's no doubt. Yeah, but I think that um, in some ways, and particularly in city government, if the people are not terribly involved, then it may be that that city government's doing a really good job. Because if people don't feel like they need to go down to City Hall to complain about something, that means they're free to pursue their lives the way they want to pursue them. And I think that at the, after 14 and a half years in municipal government, I think that a, a largely not visible city government mm -hmm. is a good city government. For anybody that's listening and doesn't know, you're a huge history buff. I don't even think that's the right word to say, well, but... Yeah, well, he definitely is. But, you know, I'd go to go to these speeches, like for the 5K in Selma, and Mayor Daly would get up there and be like... 
you know, it's almost a melting pot. We're like a spaghetti bowl. We got the tomatoes and the mushrooms and we're all together. And then Mike would get up there (laughs) and say, you know, the the significance of what our military and on July 2nd, they signed this document or whatever. And actually didn't sign it on the second. Okay. (laughs) Go go ahead. What's the story with the second? I was, I was just like, in you know, giving Tom a hard time about his little speech. This is another one of my favorite ones. So I'm going to sit up in my chair. Yeah. The birth of the United States. It happened on a Tuesday. And, Mm. um, uh, a month before, Richard Henry Lee had offered up his resolution that these mm-hmm. colonies are and of a right ought to be free and independent states, etc. And everybody knew that it was happening. Everybody knew that it was probably, it's coming. I mean, we, we started last year in April of, uh, with the, the supposed, you know, the shot heard around the world there on the, on the lawn at Lexington. And um, it, it had been coming for a long time. Mm-hmm. But then it was finally said in the form of a resolution. And everybody is, we're going to take a little break and all go back to our individual colonies and get direction. And we'll come back in a month. And so they came back on, um, on Monday, July 1st. And it was a hot day in Philadelphia. I mean, just. Imagine the clothes they were wearing at the time. Yeah, the, the right. The sweat and nastiness that that had to be. Uh, and they, they couldn't get there. They had a majority. But they, but they couldn't get to a vote of no dissenting votes. Mm-hmm. And so the conversations went on into the night. And I don't know if you watched John Adams, but the, the commentary around, you know, South Carolina would be amenable if... And that's really kind of the way it went down. When South Carolina said, you know what, we... Uh, if, if Virginia will, then we will, and we know what's coming. They got it worked out. And and, and Tuesday morning, and, and Congress was convening at 9 a.m., and um, uh, the doors closed at 9 o'clock, and it started to rain. Hmm. And um, the debate was harsh, but they kind of knew they'd figured it out and where it was going to go. And at 10 o'clock, I mean, just the bottom fell out. The rain came down hard and heavy uh, and you know, the claps of uh, uh, thunder and and the like. And I don't think that there's anything that tells us definitively what was happening in Congress and what time it happened exactly. But sometime after that storm started was when they uh, they took the vote and did the roll call. And, um, and there were 12 eyes and one abstention. And it happened. And there's no specific history that tells us that this is the case, but but history suggests that they sat or leaned or stood after the vote in some period of silence. Not because they were in being deferent to what happened, but oh crap. You know what's coming. We just we just did this. Oh boy. New York abstained. Really? And um, <laughs> hmm. more than 100 ships of the line had just arrived in the, the harbor at New York within a few days of that, right? So, you know, the full force and might of um, of the British Army and Navy were there at New York. And they're like, uh, we won't object, but we're n- going to wait for more direction. Uh, hmm. History doesn't tell us, but I, I think they were just simply being smart Boy, if things go really bad really fast, we can say we didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the day that it happened. And, and on the next day, on, Ju- on July 3rd, which was Wednesday, you know, John Adams wrote a, a letter to Abigail. And I'll, I can only summarize the, his comments because I haven't memorized it all yet. But, but he writes in his letter, and so the day has, has come and gone. And you would think me carried away with enthusiasm, but I'm not. Mm. He says, I know very well the blood and toil and treasure that it will take to preserve these states and this declaration. And he said, but, but I can see at at the end, the, the ravishing and beautiful light that, that this, that will come of this. And, and, and he said, July 2nd should be celebrated for mm-hmm. the, as the great day of deliverance for the rest of the existence of our country. And he said um, as well, 
And although we should rue it the day, I trust in God that we shall not. Hmm. And uh, it's uh, it's an incredible read to as a, a sort of an inside look into what you know, one of the delegates was thinking at the moment that it was done. They knew. They knew. They knew what they were doing. They knew how dangerous what they were doing was, and they did it anyway. And for that, and for two days later, when when Jefferson presented the uh, the committee and Jefferson presented the declaration, you know, and they said at the end, "We pledge to one another our lives, our liberty, and our sacred honor." You know, they they that was put there for a reason. They knew absolutely that they were putting their lives at risk, but doing it together. Mm-hmm. They were willing, and there was great dissension within the Continental Congress. Lots didn't want to go this route. Some found themselves not present that day mm. so that it could potentially pass. Mm. So, but that's, that's something that came of people choosing to talk to one another in a time of great crisis. What's, what's your first step in campaigning for anybody that wants to be able to do it right? Well, you don't wait. You get way ahead of it. I mean. Months? Year? Year or, or better. And you, 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 you may not spend a lot of time on, on it every day, but you think about what. What's my real messaging? What, sure. what, what am I really, why am I really doing this? You first find the why. Okay. Because everything can be built on the why. Mm-hmm. Um, after you have the why, the rest of it comes relatively easy. It, until you get to the actual execution. The tactical execution of a campaign is mathematical and scientific in, in most ways. Um, I mean, there's some art there. There's some nuance. But a lot of it is just simply understanding the... Um, the, the layout of, of where you're running, mm-hmm. who, who votes, who doesn't vote, what, what, are, what are the demographics of the people that vote? And you're, you, know, you respond to uh, all of those uh, points of, of data and information, and you craft your campaign again around the why with, with all the rest of that. And then the, the math reveals things about along where you're running about where you need to spend your time, how you need to spend your, your money. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that you don't waste time or money. Um, and if you craft a campaign with all of those parts and pieces present, then I won't say it's hard to lose, but you've got your best foot forward. Now, is that because your competition is likely not doing those things? Or? I believe that's true. How do you, how would you go about getting your name out to the public. I mean, especially if you're a new guy, I'm going to venture to say you didn't have a big social media following. Oh, back then social media wasn't a big deal. So how did, <laughs> how, did how did you go about? I uh, walked in neighborhoods. I, yeah. I, I Me knocked too. on doors. Yep. It's I a grind, doors man. And it, it's some of the best sales training on, on the planet. I mean, to some doors you'd knock on, the people would invite you in. You'd sit for 30 minutes to an hour having a conversation with them. Other ones, one of my favorite ones that I'm glad didn't go anywhere, the, the door cracked open a little bit. It hit that chain, and I heard, shh, shh. oh, shh. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild. Now with ring doorbells and stuff, too, I'm sure it's even changed. I haven't I haven't had to do it in a while, but I'm sure with ring doorbells, that's going to change a lot. But Did you yeah. have to do a lot of that for your commissioner seat? No, that one was much more of the scientific nature that I talked about earlier, the mathematical parts. I, I had... had been visible for a long time sure and so but i think to your question what mm-hmm. if there's somebody new starting out you got to be present you, you need to be uh, you know you want to you don't want to cost people in heb but if you see some somebody that looks like they're you know interested in conversation then then you you engage mm-hmm. with people you, you walk neighborhoods you one of the great things to do is walk neighborhoods evenings and weekends and just just walk there'll be people that are outside and yeah. just say hey I'm I'm so and so here. Here's a little information. I'm running for office. Love to talk to you if you like to. That's my phone number down there on the bottom. And you get one of two things. Uh, great, appreciate it. I got to get back to work. Or, well, I got a couple questions for you. Then it works. You know, a friend of mine, Joel Hicks, might be feeling this right now. The councilman in Cibolo is. You know, you 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 do all this work. You talk to all these people, and you go out and you think all these people are going to vote, and then they don't. And that's the hardest part. And so, you know, that the other part of the strategy, the tail end of that is, you got to convince them to go out and vote. And there's only two motivating factors as a salesperson. We all know this in business and everything. It's pain and pleasure, right? So you got to either scare them. Or you got to tell them something good's going to happen. It's like, look, you can put that card in the planner, but if you don't vote for me, you're not going to be able to have that color of a house. Mm-hmm. 
you, you, <laughs> you got to so make you stuff with the scare. Well, tactic, well, well, and that, and, so, and sometimes you would you would scare them. You know, the, there are some funny campaign stories. Though, and I know, I know, I know the commissioner here won't won't admit to this stuff, but I'll go ahead and do it. Is you're walking up to somebody's house and you ring their doorbell and they're like. Oh, you're running for office, you're Republican or Democrat, and you can't remember if they have a Let's Go Brandon bumper sticker or I Love Obama bumper sticker, and you're like, from you because, know. Because you saw that as you were walking yeah, up yeah, to the front door right. on you, the back of the car. And, but you forgot because you've been in you the sun. You didn't notice what was on the coffee cup. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. You just, you just walked right past it to the front door <laughs> yeah. and rang the doorbell. Yeah, right, exactly. And then you get up there, and all of a sudden you realize, like, what just happened? You know, like, oh, no, I'm in a bad spot. Uh, you know, the answer is always, of course, I'm running for a city council seat here, and so it's nonpartisan. And, and if you're running as a Republican, there's ways to find out what Republicans, you know, how, you know, whether or not who they vote for and that kind of stuff. So you, you can tell which party they vote for. But if it's a presidential election in Guadalupe County, what do, you know, 50,000 people vote on the Republican side for maybe? There's, a, there's been a high, as high a voter turnout in Guadalupe County in a presidential year in the November election as 64%. The highest. I think it's somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So, so how does that turn out? Okay, so that's a big turn. So I would say a strategy, a pro tip here, if you're looking for a seat, either do or don't do it during a presidential year, depending on how much. It, it, does it, it matter? Can be, it can be done in any year. Well, yeah, anything can be done. Well, well the, primar- time, the like, primaries the in factors, March. Depending on the factors are a little different based on turnout. Sure. You know, if you're in, in an odd year where there's neither a midterm nor a presidential election, there's a different set of factors there. Okay. Um, if you're in a midterm, they change moderately. And if you're in a presidential year, there, there's there's lots more, there are many more variables. And um, you, you just don't know that your first time out. And so if you've got the means and hiring someone who's been there, done that is extremely helpful. I didn't have the means, so I had to learn by trial and error. Tom Daly, the first time, well, the only time he's ever had an opponent. He r- w- knocked on every house in Selma. His twice. opponent was a, 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 a CPA, by the way. Yeah, and he's and he's back he's up. My CPA. Yeah, and, and, and I he's hear both sides of this. Story. Yeah, I think he's actually just a few <laughs> yeah, buildings yeah, yeah, yeah. down. Man. Yeah, Jim Jim Parma was mayor, and he's back on the council, and mm-hmm. and I, and and we'll get to tell that story someday when I got to make the phone call and ask him if he would do it, and then told Tommy I was thinking about calling Jim, and I'd already <laughs> called him, and and uh, you know he got mad, but he. We all worked it out. So, so when it comes to campaigning, you got to talk money. How, how, is this a cheap thing to do? Is it? It can be. Where is your money best spent? Ah, uh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> it really is. A lot of people spend an inordinate amount of money on signage. Mm-hmm. With signage, as long as you have a relative parity with your opponent or impo- opponents, you just don't need that much more than that. Mm. And in some cases. Less is more. Mm-hmm. So the last time that I ran a, a campaign, you know, people like to put lots of signs out in front of the polling location. Mm-hmm. Two was all that I put out. Yeah, w- were they in front of your opponents? Never. No. <laughs> it's actually an advantage to get there early and have your opponent put their sign in front of your sign. <laughs> that's but that's but that's a little that's a nuanced yeah. strategy there. When just well, let them do it. That, that that's uh, that's in the uh, that's in the paid course. From well, like, <laughs> yeah. it, is go. it true the first time you ran for mayor, you had more signs? If everybody that had a sign in their yard voted, you would have won. So that's that's in two thousand four. The first time I ran for city council, I went back and looked at the who voted list. And if every single person who had my sign in their yard had remembered to go out and vote on Saturday instead of thinking it was on Tuesday, I'd have won. The two things that need to be largest on your political signs are your name and the name of the office that you're running for. So if you go back and look at the signs that I had when I was running for county commissioner, there were only two words you could read at 100 yards. Carpenter, Carpenter and commissioner. commissioner. Nothing else was could you make out at 100 yeah. yards, but you could see that at 100 yards. Mm-hmm. And everything else, was, now, you have to follow the law. You're, the, the four and other things have to be a certain yeah. size in comparison to the other letters. For a little while, I used printing signs. Mm-hmm. And I get realtors was my primary customer. And what's hilarious to me is the scrutiny that some of these realtors will put on their signs. And I'm like, listen, from a practicality point, you're driving down the road at 30, 40 miles an hour. Are you going to be reading all the shit that you want to put on your sign? No. <laughs> you know? They don't care like what you you're... Said, you got to, you know, you're driving down the road, you see carpenter commissioner. You don't even have to look at the sign. You just, at this point, you see it a couple of times. Message. You know that's what it is. I don't want to. I don't want to mess up that message with a bunch of superfluous information. There was another thing, too, that uh, Mike and I have in common. Um, I own one of your guitars. 
You do. Yeah. My wife bought it for me for Christmas, uh, not last year, the year before, I believe, mm-hmm. right? Two years. Yeah. And so I have a, uh, one of Mike's guitars, and, and I play guitar, and, and you play guitar. And and actually, that guitar that you own now uh, made its first appearance in a public performance in the Blue Bonnet Palace. Wow. Really? Yeah. I was invited to sit in on a couple of songs with uh, Gary Glint and 20X Band. Really? Wow. Yeah. So that guitar that you have yeah. right there has been... Uh, uh, plugged in and played at the Blue Bonnet Palace. Both you guys ride, and yeah. so and you, your your Goldwing is is what year? It's uh, a nine, it's a two thousand two thousand okay two thousand one I believe it's the first year of the eighteen hundreds. Okay, and is that about the same size bike you have? So it's a little smaller, but um, <laughs> you have the big gr- the, the big however, green. Here comes yeah, the here map. We, here we go. Five, seven here we go. Pull, pull the map on. up. All right. Again. <laughs> I but get it. I will hey, say, Carpenter, stand up. I am standing. <laughs> I will say, though, his 1800 is the smoothest riding bike you can get. You know, so I have a Harley. The Harley is parked out front. And, um, you know, I went with the bigger motor, not because I've got ego issues, but just because. And so, but, I mean, it's 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 a, it's a different ride. It's definitely a different ride. The, between the But his bike is a smooth, you enjoy the wind in your hair. Harley is also somewhat like that, but you, in the back of your mind, you're hoping that you're not going to blow something. So <laughs> I would say he's probably have a lot less stress on his ride. Yeah, than mine. And there's 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 a um, the with a with a V twin. I mean, you just got a lot of, of compression coming down into a central place, central and there's a, the, the 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 vibration and motion is quite different from the uh, the Goldwing. The Goldwing has a horizontally opposed six cylinder 1.8 liter engine in it. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's a car engine, uh, and and it, and it's just, it's just smooth engine. It's 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 you won't know it's, it's a different unless ride. you rev it. You okay, know? I mean it's yeah. it's a it's a it's a smooth bike. Your wife, mm-hmm. you married up, yes, big time. <laughs> like me, you are incredibly lucky to have Missy as your wife, and I think the world of her. I know Amy and her have a wonderful relationship, but. When you were mayor and stuff, you know, you, you were busy. You you had your business, you had your boys and stuff was going on. And Missy sometimes would get to an event before you and, be, and everybody's like, where's Mike? And don't worry, he's coming and blah, blah, blah. She was like your rock, just always there. Incredible. She will also sometimes hold you accountable. <laughs> oh, boy. And that's what every good wife should do. But you two are life partners that are meant to be forever and it's just you know there's mike and missy you know it's kind of like jill and kevin you know and and yeah. uh, you know i don't think you would be and correct me if i'm wrong you definitely wouldn't be where you are now without her being there with you i have no and, question and, in my mind yes i'm i'm extraordinarily blessed to be married to my very best friend well the more i get to you know sometimes you meet people and they're a lot of fun and then after you get to know them for a while that it kind of tarnishes a little and with your wife, I, I it's like I appreciate and like her more. You know, it's like wow, she's more interesting than I even thought before. You know, and because she's she's, you know, the first time you meet her, she you know she's very detail oriented, very thorough. You know, you have a conversation, and you know, well, I went to H E B and got some milk, and she's like, well, where'd you park? What where where what what kind of milk? You know, and you know all that kind. Of, and w- once you get used to that, you start to appreciate her more. And and I just. Uh, I just think that, you know, I just wanted to make sure I said that to you. You know, I had you, you know, here with my cup and my trophy in my place. And, you know, I just wanted to make sure I said that. Do either of y'all yell? I do. Can't, no, I'm, not, I'm not talking to you. I know you do. Oh. Uh, I'm, I'm talking to a... I'm, I'm, I'm do, talking. do either of you, my you wife and, you or and, me? Yeah, you and Jill. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, you and Missy. Yeah. Not, not you. <laughs> okay, I thought you were talking to me. Yeah, yeah, I, I know you yell. I yell all the time. You and your wife are so chilled, relaxed, very easygoing, easy to approach, easy to talk to. Um, I can't imagine either one of y'all yelling. Please tell me that you, there's something that one of we, y'all have done to piss each other off so bad you'll yell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike Mike gets yelled at. You told I mean, me yeah. that there were not going to be <laughs> questions like this. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> Early in our relationship, I was... Not a particularly mature, intelligent spouse. And I was irritated with Missy for some reason. We'll just leave it for whatever it was. 
and she had been to the grocery store and came into our apartment and I said something along the lines of, hey, why don't you kick off your shoes and get over there in the kitchen where you ought to be? <laughs> oh, no. Shit. Now, she didn't yell at me. Oh. However, she did reach into a paper paper, paper grocery paper. bag, because that's Especially what we time. used at the time, reached in and, 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 and broke open a um um a container of aluminum cans filled with i don't recall what it was some really cheap brand extracted one of those cans with one hand in one motion and turned and sidearmed it right at my head and i caught it about right here Ooh. <laughs> now a few a few important things that came from that and we, and, and, First and, of all, it's good reflexes by we, both yeah. parts there. We, 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 might, we might need to edit, edit this out, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, first, I learned that uh, an intelligent husband doesn't speak that way uh, yeah. to his, uh, his spouse. Second thing I learned was that she had played softball a lot. <laughs> oh, um, really? As a, yeah. as, a, as a younger one. Yeah. Um, and mm. that, um, uh, that she had a very forceful personality. And hmm. frankly, it, it was very close to that moment that yeah. I knew absolutely that uh, that she was the woman I wanted to be married to for the rest of my life. What do you hope to accomplish as being commissioner? Uh, it's a it's a great question, and I enjoy answering that one. I get excited about when we find ways, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, yeah. when we find ways for political subdivisions to cooperate with one another and maximize the value that's gained from the pool of tax dollars that's been remitted. Yeah. That that gets me excited. That that gets me thinking about. Wow, that we maybe we can do things that are going to leave this place better than than where we found it. Mm. What's the one thing that you wish you would have known before starting in politics? I, I would say commissioner, but you're, eight, you're sixteen months, eighteen months in. So, uh, do you have a, a one thing you wish you'd known before you got into commissioner, or can we just lump that into being? In how about politics? if I how about if I I do a little political two step and uh, <laughs> answer the question the way I want to answer it? Sure. Um, I wish that I knew more when I entered the mayor's office than I did because the learning curve is so extraordinary. More about what? The whole thing. Just how it works? The, I think you heard me say earlier that, that the seven years that I was in the mayor's office is the greatest education, education of my life, right? That you can't go to a university and learn all of the things that I learned in that environment. Mm-hmm. And I would have been more effective if I had known more about all of those various things. But time and grade, sure. it, it takes time. And I don't know of a way to teach that. That would be an interesting curriculum at the university level. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I would have liked to have had greater knowledge. I did not really understand some of the possibilities and potentialities that can exist amongst political subdivisions that choose to work together with one another. Until I was out of office. So what would you have done different? I mean, is there a way that you could have better been uh, been educated better before you get in? Is there something that you would have? I don't think so. Hang but on. you said if I could wave a magic wand and have something different than, but, sure. but actually do different? No. There's nothing I've done in my life that, it would, that I would change today. If I did, it would change the outcome of who I am and, and where sure. I've, what I've done. Sure. That's yeah. fair. <clears throat> Best <clears throat> advice you ever received? There's been a lot. Shut up and listen. You Can we in, use that as our like our teaser for the <laughs> that's perfect? Shut, shut up, up and listen. That is, that is perfect. <laughs> there we go. We're gonna we're gonna, that's gonna <laughs> that's come up for your podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's name that's of the show. Uh, shut, shut up and, and listen. <laughs> listen. Uh, I love it. No, that that is great. Like killer. That's really good advice. And 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 I'll tell you, it's good advice for anybody who's uh, uh, in their first term in public office. Just, just don't don't think you have all the answers right now. Mm-hmm. Quiet and listen. There's a there's a. a, a, a an abundance of education that you can gain just by listening and hearing from people, uh, whether they're other electeds, people that are part of the organization, people that are in the public. Mm-hmm. Uh, the worst thing, and I don't want to speak in absolutes, but nearly perhaps the worst thing that a newly elected person or any anybody in a leadership position can bring to that job is an abundance of ignorance and arrogance at once. It's terrible. And when that happens, bad things happen. So the the shut up and listen part is about you, you, 
you may get away with bringing the arrogance from time to time, but you're not going to overcome that co- coupled with the ignorance. And mm-hmm. when you shut up and listen, you start to dis- dissipate that ignorance. Mm. Okay. I like it. <clears throat> How long is the, um, it, 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 are there term limits in the, as a commissioner? There are not. So I know this is going to be probably difficult, but do you see it? Do you say an, do you see an expiration date for you? Like, you, you had seven years as mayor, you had 14 years in, you know, the city of shirts, you knew it was time to move on. Do you, f- and uh, that's probably a good question. I'm sure you didn't know that going into it, like I got 14 mm-hmm. years, you know, it was just, you no. knew the time was now, you know, mm-hmm. do you have an idea of what type of time frame you're looking at with uh, the seat that you hold now? I, I don't know yet. I don't know what still happen And, um, uh, to try and prognosticate, I would I would probably end up being wrong. But you know, look what happened at three days at Thermopylae, right? I mean, the whole world can mm-hmm. change in a very short time period. What's the biggest myth about being um, the commissioner? What's the biggest being myth? the commissioner? What's the biggest myth that you've heard people think that what that is just not oh, true about me? Oh no, and no, it's just about the the position, the commissioner position. People think what. What, what, what is the biggest load of crap that people think the commissioner is responsible for? And probably even probably better question to be the mayor. Yeah, that's what I was, I was going to twist that around and say it's really <laughs> about the mayor. Um, the so, belief that the mayor can do anything, can do anything, that the mayor can act, act in, a, in a singular, unilateral manner and effect change or solve a problem. Can't do it. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> thank you for coming. Michael here. Carpenter. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Actually, probably eight and one because I really didn't know what I was doing the first yeah. time out. Well, so speaking of not knowing what you're doing, how long have you been in? <laughs> that, that was horrible. <laughs> yeah. Appartment. Is that a real word you would use? Police chief and my EMS yeah. director, EMS director, both went, "Yep, that's a mayor <laughs> word." <laughs> I thought you were independently wealthy. Uh, no. <laughs> at at no time and at no point. Um, <laughs> Bad breakfast at your favorite restaurant or. <laughs> I just noticed the cop. <laughs> We're an hour and 20 in, and I just noticed the cop. But that's part of, you know, I'm kind of a geek for this stuff. You know, I watch shirts council meetings, obviously. I kind of yeah. know what's going, you know, what's going so, on. I, I didn't bring that up. I didn't ask you how many you've watched. Or yeah, well, this what was... This is what you do for entertainment on Wednesday night. All right, night. all right. Let, let me change this up. You told me that there were not going to be <laughs> questions like this. <laughs> And here we go. <laughs> thank you, Mike. Thank you for coming. Michael here. Carpenter. My yeah, pleasure. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> the laugh track. Wow. <laughs>